equal stages of script number two. Kobunasechi and the Blinkards. James Gibbs talks to Aisha Casely Hayford about the Ghanaian nationalist lawyer and playwright. Hello, James. Hi, Aisha. Lovely to be doing this interview with you. If I may, I want to start straight in on quite a personal note, because I'm interested in your personal experience and relationship with Ghana and when it comes to Kobuna Sechi, how that has influenced your interest, understanding and engagement with Kobuna Sechi's work over, over these years. Mm. Well, I went to work in Ghana in 1968 um, as a teacher at the University of Ghana. And uh, that's where my link with the country started. And uh, I married um, Patience Addo. And uh, we've recently celebrated our golden wedding anniversary. Um, Congratulations. And, yeah, so there's been a continuing link with, uh, with Ghana all those times, as you can imagine. So we have the family kinds of twos and fro's that you might expect with calls coming in from Tema and news of, of what uh, children and grandchildren are doing that is being shared around. So we've become a, an anglo ghanaian family and um, linking that in with, with Kobe Nasechi is, is quite a big jump because obviously Kobe Nasechi is just a kind of small part of, of my encounter with Ghana and when it comes down to anything deep within the text of the Blinkards, I go to my wife and ask her about it because she's got so much more background. And although uh, Tripong is her first language, uh, Chui is her second language, and Gar is her third Ghanaian language. And through the, um, the Chui, of course, she, she has access to the Fanti that uh, that Kobana Sechi incorporates in his play. So when I have taught the play, I've always made it a joint teaching exercise in which I've managed to get her involved as well because the linguistic and the cultural elements are so much more accessible to her than to me. I don't know, I mean, obviously there's a lot more to say in, in many different directions, but I don't wonder if that triggers off any questions and thoughts in your mind, Aisha. Do you like the play? What do you think of it? Well, I, I do like it, and I think it's an important play, and, and I've enjoyed my engagement with it. I think it's quite a flawed play. It's not, it's not a perfect play. It doesn't all work equally well, but it has a tremendous vigour and energy, and lots of it works very well on, on the stage. Um, of course, in a sense, um, I was interested in Ghanaian writing before the Blinkards was much talked about. This was because the Blinkards was just forgotten about. And clearly there, there were people who were remembering it, many of them, who, who saw it in, in uh, 1915, will be dead by now or will have been too young to, to have really engaged with the play. But it is an extraordinary act of resurrection that brought this play to us in the 70s. The publishing of this book was really thanks to the fact that some extraordinary men and some extraordinary times came to, came together. And one of the men was uh, Ayo Langley, who um, started his history studies in Wales, moved on to do his PhD in Edinburgh, and uncovered and discovered um, the, the archives that the, uh, that the Sechi family had given to Cape Coast. And he explored those carefully, and he found some things that he hadn't expected at all. And he took along the text of the Blinkards that he, he chanced upon and uh, took it to a man called Rex Collins, who was a publisher, and had a real eye for, uh, for picking up the unusual watership down was his great discovery. Um, it had been passed over by dozens of publishers, but Rex realized that it was a seller, a winner, a delight. So he published Watership Down, but he was really interested in African writers and he was really making his way into the Nigerian market. He was very close to Wallace Shoinka. He It was 
Rex Collings, who got Shoenka to publish, uh, to write, first of all, Ake, The Years of Childhood, the book which really um, made him a household name, I would have said, so far as he is a household name. So Rex Collings was there working on African literature. He had some money because books were selling well in Nigeria because of the oil boom that they were going through in the early 70s. Um, Rex didn't want to take the book on entirely by himself. He wanted to spread the risk and the load a bit. So he, um, he, he brought in James Curry, who was with Chenua Achebe, the editor of uh, African Writer Series at Heinemann's, and he brought in Donald Herdeck, who was in Washington, DC, and had set up the Three Continents Press and he put together a deal that um, meant they could, I think they printed 7,000 copies, which was quite a risky and large number. Um, and they, they could take that risk because there was money coming into their businesses, Heinemann's, for example, from Nigeria, which was enjoying the, the first wave of the, um, of the oil revenues that were to bring both triumph and disaster happiness and, and horror. So there was a, a combination of factors that meant that uh, the Blinkards, even though it was a cumbersome book with lots of blank pages in it, could be published. So they put together um, a package that meant that the book was going to be published as a paperback and as a hardback in the UK and in the US and in the areas of the world that London and New York have traditionally divided the world into. So it came into our hands and it, it was a revelation and a, and a delight and rolled back the years. Um, you know, I, uh, as, as far as the history that we could teach of, of Ghanaian theatre, written theatre in English and in African languages was concerned, it took us way back to this performance in 1915. It was tremendously exciting. And I did see the, um, the reading, the, the script in hand production that uh, Ajoa Andu pushed very hard and, and that uh, she, she put on at the Drill Hall in London for, for an audience that you can imagine of uh, Londoners, some of whom uh, were bilingual in English and Fanti because they were, it was well supported by the Ghanaian community, but um, there were others of us who, who, who weren't following the, the Fanti and uh, had to, to make do as best we could during those, those passages. So it was a very exciting moment, and it was lovely that Joe Ando was able to do that. I think she said that uh, it was really because her father loved the play so much and was so passionate about it, that she put it on as an act of, of daughterly devotion, in a way. It, that, that was a lovely family occasion, too. It's so interesting that you say that, because my father also said that when I told him I was looking at the Blinkard. So clearly something happened in the education system in Ghana and how they were relating to the play and studying it, because he felt that, that the play spoke so much to him and it holds a very special place in his heart and I do understand that because it is so much about empowerment and you know really staying with that Ghanaian pride it being pre you know independence where it really captures that spirit of you know that what was going about to happen over the next um 30 40 years or so as we led towards the 1957 you know change in Ghana coming into existence I also find it fascinating what you've said about the link with oil, knowing what set she felt about commerce and, you know, so how interesting that that actually has been the saviour for the Blinkards, you know, in its yeah. own way. It didn't drown in oil, it was buoyed up by oil in, a, in an extraordinary way. And, and, you know, this is all part of the publishing story of, of Ghana and of Ghanaian authors, and, and that's a fascinating topic in, in itself. Um, clearly, when the play was first put on, there was an immediate response that this should be published. And there were 
comments in, in the newspapers that your family was deeply involved in producing in Cape Coast, the Gold Coast uh, leader, for example, they, they were talking about the importance of publishing this play. Now, I, I think it was probably a bit raw. It's a bit rough around the edges. I, it, it, it would have benefited from um, a good few months more work on it. I, I think what we've got is a rather rushed job. I, I think there are loose ends, and I think that Sechi himself must have felt that, well, it's wonderful to have done it, and it does work on the stage, but uh, I, I would like to think, and, and his other work is so meticulously produced and carefully finished, I would expect that he was somebody who, who, who would want to polish it a bit. And, and then when uh, I was able to dig around a bit and follow leads that other people had had shown me to to find out about the first production, I mean it was an absolute nightmare. So the idea that you've got you, you don't finish the play on the first night and you have to say please come back next week. I mean that's a director's nightmare. <laughs> nightmare. But then when you look at at how he got into this position. And, and how, for example, the um, the venue, the school, the Methodist school, and Fansipin had suddenly said, oh, no, you can't do the play here. You can't use our premises. We think you're a mischievous free thinker. And you have to find somewhere else to put it on. Now, <laughs> of course, that's terrible. Putting on a play is such a difficult and delicate thing to do that to suddenly find that your venue has been taken away from you with, within, a, uh, I don't know, a matter of days or weeks is horrifying. But they overcame that problem and they, they found another venue. They built another stage. I mean, heaven knows what sort of problems um, they, they encountered. But they managed to soldier on and they, they put it on. They, they did it. Yes, and I mean, it's this idea of it being in two parts is hilarious. And knowing my home country the way I do and going to the National Theatre there still now, I mean, people arrive not when it necessarily starts. They arrive when, you know, you have people coming in and out during the show. It does go on for hours still now. It's very much that's kind of the rhythm of the performance and the sharing of storytelling. So I can actually really envisage this quite comical um, play of, um, and the way the play is, you know, you can just walk in perhaps at the wedding scene, for example, and you can be deep within the play and sort of see all the characters and all the mayhem. Like it is almost written as lots of, it's so many massive events linked together. And when you said what it's like for it to be staged, because it's just full of physical comedy, isn't it? Because I, I really found that when I was trying to do the audio, like, actually, some bits are just not going to be captured. Some of the jokes, they just can't be because it is slapstick and um, that's very integral to the delivery of it. Yes, he sort of learned from the pantomime and, and, and from the London review stages and the musicals and so on. And I know you're looking particularly at at Act Four, and there you have these these two men who come on, and, and they're obviously a double act, and and one feels where has he got that from? Uh, he he talks in the text. There's a reference to uh, to to Mrs. Brofusem and how she she stays with Mrs. Gush at the seaside and a particular resort, and uh, and uh, the lawyer says, oh yes, I think I went there one weekend in a very offhand way. And, and there would have been opportunities to see peerhead entertainments. And these would have appealed to him, the slapstick. And again, in that double act, the two men, one is so obviously a shadow of the other. It's, it's an eternal theatrical success story, that double act. And we find, we, we find Beckett picking it up in Waiting for Godot because, because it's, it's uh, so universally popular. And... And, and then when you think of the concert party that hadn't really got going in Cape Coast when Sechi was, was writing, um, there were um, entertainments of various kinds, including the kind that, you know, Mrs. Brothel Sam would like, uh, where they have some delicate piano playing and a little bit of recitation, but also more robust entertainments than that. 
and 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 you feel that Sechi has got a sense of humor, a very acute sense of humor, and he can weave this all together, and he's managed to put it into this package that has miraculously come down to us, and it's survived all these years and all this neglect. It was just astonishing how um, Sechi put his playwriting aside, not completely, because when I was in the Cape Coast archive, I saw the Alan and Unwin um, proofs of um, various things that he had sent. So he was trying to get things published, um, and, and um, the opportunities were very limited. Clearly, the newspapers were crucial, and, and uh, those of us who enjoy Ghanaian novels as well as plays had been delighted by Marita, who may very well be very closely linked to your family, because it's just signed, as it were, by a native, and we don't know who this native was, but he very well may have been a Casely Hayford, for all, for, he, he, for all I know. I, I don't think the authorship is, is decided as yet. But they, that, that novel has been recovered and shared and enjoyed, and it is wonderful to hear, hear not only the contemporary generation, but also earlier generations. Because when, when I got interested in African writing as a postgraduate student in America, it was because I, I could hear these new voices, important new voices that hadn't really been published much before. And now in the 60s and 70s, the Heinemann African Writers Series was bringing novel after novel and poet after poet and introducing them to us. And, and the plays were the same. So it was delightful to, to encounter those new voices, uh, both novels and, and plays, and to find in Coppin Sechi a very serious man, a, a rather, perhaps sometimes a rather grumpy man. I don't know. He was known for being very stubborn. There's no doubt about that. But he also had this wonderful sense of humor, and, and he was so passionate about, about what he believed about his Ethiopianism, if you like. Yes, that is so, so clear, and that seems such an accurate and authentic description of him in respect of his commitment to the causes that he was so dedicated to and believed in. Well, we're so lucky to have things like Ethiopia Unbound as well, and, and also one of the interesting things is the way that poets and poetry did step forward in the, in the independence struggle, if you like. There, there was an outpouring of poetry. And one of the things that struck me today, just looking through copies of the Gold Coast Leader, how often there were poems put it in, into, the, into the newspaper. Now, sometimes they were perhaps rather, rather public. They were, they were rather like anthems. They weren't perhaps as, as carefully wrought or as deeply felt as we might have hoped. But... Poetry, um, and, and we find with Ezekwe, for example, who, who moved between Nigeria and Ghana, encouraging journalists and uh, owning newspapers, he, he, he was a poet himself, and he quoted a lot of poetry in his speeches. Um, I, think, I think it's quite natural to move into poetry when, when you are involved in a political uh, campaign. Yeah, that's very fair. <laughs> Uh, there was an event that I would like to discuss and certainly pick your brains on, and I think our people listening to this would be interesting to interested to hear your take and view on it. And it's this incident which you um, have referred to in your in the program for the two thousand and four Drill Hall event, and you titled it "What Happened to Sechi at Sea." So, what I understand from my own knowledge is there was an incident in spring 1917. It was a historical event of a passenger ship being torpedoed by the Germans. And this was took place off Plymouth. And Sechi was a passenger on that ship. Um, we're not entirely sure the name of the ship. It could have been the Abosso or the Faloba, as I understand it. But there was a discussion that took place as people were jumping off the ship or jumping onto lifeboats and apparently something very racist was said I don't want to say much more because it's not my expertise area but you know what I'm talking about and I'd love to hear 
your understand of that and how that how in your view that may have influenced the setting well, we see today i think that episode is is fascinating and particularly if we look at what um baku says um the the phd student who wrote his thesis on Cobin Asechi looks very carefully at this episode and, and also what happened afterwards um, when there were people who, who wrote in the Gold Coast press, what a shame that a black person should be rescued and white people died. That mood and attitude was clearly around. But I think that, that actually there's been some mythologizing here, some... Um, heightening of, of the drama um, from, if we look at, at Baku, and I would just recommend everybody to go to his thesis, and all you have to do is, is type in B-A-K-U, Coburn and Setchi and Sussex, then you don't, get, you don't get immediate access to the text, as you found, but um, it tells you where the, where the story is retold, and, and the historian, I think, looks very carefully at it. Um, historians do work things out and say there can be no doubt about the boat or the ship. There was some confusion at the beginning, but now we can go to passenger lists and we can find out where um, Sechi was. We can find that he was torpedoed. And there is one account that he, he, he has written himself that is, is among his, his scattered and not collected works in which he describes and gives credit to one of the stewards on the boat for helping him off the boat and to safety. The story which involves white people in a lifeboat rejecting Sechi and perhaps committing a, a crime against the law of the sea by not letting him onto the boat, I think that is, is, a, is sort of manufactured partly from the letter that I referred to that appeared where people obviously resented the fact that black people had lived when white people had died. I, I think it's even more fascinating than a strict, uh, as it were, contradiction. It shows how stories are made and how stories are remembered. And we've already encountered the fact that when it comes to Coburn Asechi, there is a good deal of forgetting about him. Uh, if we tried to find out about him as a playwright, we find that by 1956, when the obituaries were being written, nobody was referring to him as a playwright. They'd forgotten about that. He'd done more important things and he'd become a different kind of person, a rather remote person, probably in him, a little bit of snobbishness that we've got to take along with his, uh, his wit and his energy and his commitment. So we find him... Um, rather isolated in 1956. Um, I think the, the main movements have, have passed him by um, and he's observing in his, in his old age, um, still passionate about his values, but not entirely in tune with the Ghana that is emerging from the Gold Coast. As you rightly said, James, there's been a revival of the blinkers now and it's being rediscovered which is very very exciting as far as what's next do you have any views or hopes well i i don't know i'm i i'm i'm following the the syllabuses that uh, that there are in in theater arts departments and and there is a an interest in the play in various places um in in nigeria for example and in ghana in 2007, when Ghana celebrated 50 years of independence, The Blinkers was one of the plays that was put on to mark that occasion. Um, now that we've had it in our possession for a little while, and we've done straight productions of it, I wonder whether the time hasn't come for perhaps an engagement with the, with the text and, and perhaps some modification. When the text was first sent to James Curry, he sent it out to uh, a Ghanaian man of letters called Yao Yoansa. Uh, and he wrote a reader's report. This is very good to have reader's reports. They're very frank. 
and, and, and critics and academics like writing them because you get paid instantly for your text. And uh, yeah, answer wrote in saying, well, it's pretty good. I, I like the play. It's still very relevant, and it's going to go on being relevant. So that's the first thing to say about the play. It's going to go on being relevant. Um, he was concerned about the transcription of the Fanti because, as he said, styles and patterns of orthography have changed. So there were some modifications made, and I'm sure that any Fanti linguist would want to say, no, we don't spell it that way anymore, or we don't write it that way anymore. So, so that would change. But would uh, a, a bright young dramatist get hold of the play and say, yes, it's good, but it could be better. It could be tighter. Um, I'm not sure that uh, they might try to distort it and make it into a well-made play. I wouldn't encourage that, but I would... I say that there are opportunities for for work on it, and, and the very act of doing the work would be tremendously instructive. Um, this is a really tricky question. How how much do you interfere with with a text that you think may have been somewhat hastily put together? Um, I, I would say, learn from the concert party. Learn from the way in which that somewhat liquid, loose structure works and see if, if uh, you can't re-engage with the blinkers. I, I would like to see a well-established uh, Ghanaian playwright, um, obviously something like Martin Owusu, for example, has actually he's made a film of the blinkers, so he knows it well. Um, but perhaps giving him a slightly free hand or, 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 or his successor uh, a free hand to engage with the text, engage with the ideas, and, and make it somewhat tighter and get rid of some of the repetitions and heighten some of the, the really effective passages that we find there. And that's where I see the future for this play. Thank you very much. Let's see what happens. That's an absolutely wonderful breadth of information to really help us understand this man and his work. Thank you very, very much, James. It's been an absolute delight to speak to you. Well, it's lovely to share it with you. It's lovely to talk to you, Aisha. Thank you so much. For, it's so delightful to engage with younger people. <laughs> that was Kobanasechi and the Blinkards with James Gibbs and Aisha Casely-Hayford. <laughs>